Hello everyone, today we look at Lotharingian and Western Frankish warfare with Charles the Simple's campaign against Western Francia and in part within the same Lotharingia in 922. So just an example uh, out of the many, but as we've seen already in, in the series about uh, Ottonian warfare, right, these single campaigns are very uh, useful to dimension uh, and picture what warfare, in this case in uh, early 10th century Central Europe, what really was about. And um, there is, of course, a context that today I can't fully digress on, but the protagonists are Charles the Simple, the son of Louis the Stammerer, the eldest son of Charles the Bald, who uh, you know outlived his father just one year and a half because physically weak fundamentally, and Hugh the Great that belonged to the uh, essentially the, the Robertian line of the Dukes of Paris, who had basically taken over power in, in Western Francia, and so uh, obliging Charles to abandon the land to take refuge in Lotharingia that was instead largely under his, his control. I think I never made a bit of specifically just on Lotharingia, of course we know what what we're talking about, even though it's one of those countries that fundamentally didn't uh, didn't survive, right? You know, the the various um, in this case, like the Carolingian partitions per se. But I promise uh, we will do something about that time allowing more in depth. So this is actually a good uh, chance to to talk about it um, in the first place. Um, and this campaign. Um, is um, essentially consisting in the uh, invasion again of Western France uh, with, by Charles the Simple, who raid a uh, Lotharingian expeditionary force. So, by Lotharingian, in this context, we, uh, you know, the boundaries varied at some point, but it was essentially east of the Meuse River. Uh, and thus, here I, I did insert some. Um, maps but they do not show like in in deep detail like the the actual settlements of the sign should find something um more um more academic and unfortunately more copyrighted um to to post but say the the sequence is relatively simple though like the geographical ref references here are just you know for the the bigger um picture most we will see, of course, more in depth where the armies operated, etc. Um, and you you have this fact series of um, Atlantic um, valleys that um, are a bit like the 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 basin uh, over which Carolingian power had uh, been born, right, and had uh, drawn most of its manpower. Uh, agricultural resources, etc. And as we are noticing the political context before, this struggle was for probably the, the reconquest of the most prized Western Francia, Western Francia. So with Paris, that I just made a, a video recently on its medieval history, um, that was already de facto the, essentially the most important center uh, in the region. But that still was emerging among others, and the control of, as we'll see now, fortresses along this major uh, water routes, uh, including some affluents of, of the same sin here, where, where, as we'll see, the theater of, of the campaign uh, was, uh, really were aimed um, by, by Charles right, to uh, retake control of... Of, of of Paris, like in ideally, right? This campaign specifically was not about that, but but a major engagement that, however, the Saint Charles somehow stayed away from because it was objectively very risky overall. Um, could have changed significantly the situation. This campaign, as we will see now, is essentially about siege warfare. Um, Compared to the Ottonian expeditions we've seen before, this, this is um, uh, different because, of course, uh, siege warfare is basically still the one that triggers most uh, 
um, medieval campaigns, like if you look at the major, 15 major engagements, talking properly about battles of the Etonian times, um, we've seen the one of Lenzen, for example, uh, like they all gravitated around the, uh, the, the, the break uh, of a siege, right, or the maintenance of it from the other side. Uh, the invasion of Thuringia in 933, Riade uh, against the Myers in 933, Andernach in 939, Belt in 43, uh, the battle against Conrad the Red um, on the Maas in 953, Regensburg uh, on the Danube in 954, Lechfeld 955. Uh, we've seen the Rechnitz River as well. Then in Italy, Rome in uh, 964, Ascoli in 969, um, just Burton in 39 was like uh, let's say a, an open field engagement without essentially a strategic context revolving uh, around siege war. We'll, we'll see this hopefully in the future as well. But as we've seen, um, Central Europe, um, say true Central Europe, here Lotharingia by some degree can be intended as, as the West um, and uh, as parts of Western Germany itself, like the Rhineland, like mostly the Romanized uh, areas um, but, um, you know, it was very different from in fact, Western Francia. It was much more heavily fortified encastellated for a number of reasons. First, yes, the, the Roman cities that were still counting as a massive infrastructure, especially at this point during the second invasion, the, the bishops taking over the, the control, the, the defense, the militias, the uh, the walls, uh, say, manning and all this stuff. We'll see it further, but it's a major feature of post carolingian Europe. But also because um, Western Francia was um, very rich, right? Much richer, it had a much greater surplus, which is the same reason why Initially, this situation uh, was much more politically intricated, and the country appears much more politically fragmented because, uh, in Gaul, in this also towards this northeastern um, part towards towards Germany, the um, the, uh, the 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 local nobility, the individual lords, could invest like much greater surplus in fortifications. Right, so it, it is a say. Uh, false weakness we were to appreciate the absolute forces that were moving like here and and this campaign I think illustrates it fairly well because aside from the temper of the commanders that surely played a role and the uh, the mistakes that may have been done here and there but shows a deeply fortified net right this is not just just about the the, the major natural obstacles that is the rivers uh, but Properly, the fortresses, as we'll see now, built on on the fortings, on the bridges, the the other cities, in fact, and um, and uh, and uh, towns that were significantly larger. What we've seen uh, in uh, on the Slavic frontier, right? So it makes everything much more dependent on this massive manpower and uh, necessary to reach like the local superiority to be able to launch an assault to the walls, right? The, the, the same problem was actually, we've, we've seen it with the Etonian invasions of Bohemia, was not different, except these centers were much larger, right, by, by scale. Um, so um, they required larger armies that uh, very often were not available. As we were saying before, some infrastructures remained even after the, the their say, the, the collapse, the, the decadence, the, um, uh, in part the, the, the shrinking also of the internal centers, and, and their possibility of manning them effectively, this was, was an issue, right? Um, fortresses per se are, do not have a strategic value, it's just how you employ them, right, in function of your, your armored forces that actually makes them um, so. So this is, I think, a, an interesting uh, and relatively brief also um, overview of, of this year's uh, fighting, right? Um, so Hugues the Great from Paris was a aggressive as well, right? He uh, 
uh, had deployed his forces specifically to attack the stronghold at Epernay, uh, which was already besieged by the, the Western forces. We'll call them like this, like the Western Frankish and the Lotharingians, right? To make it, or the Westerners, simply, and the Lotharingians. Now, first, the royal army, so the one of Charles the Simple, that still had objectively the right of rule, the, the Robertians were still a relatively obscure line, right? It's even as some of, still what would become some of the most important uh, in post Carolingian in Europe. So, the first maneuver here was the crossing of the Marne River and the encampment uh, in the face of uh, Hugues' army fortifications around Epernay. You know that sieges were entailing not just the storming, but first of all the, the blockade right, of the settlement uh, through this uh, field fortifications for which nobody could uh, get in or go out. Right? And so basically strangling the settlement, hopefully, and, and necessarily, even if you needed for any other strategic reason, like this one in time, to storm a settlement before, um, before an enemy army arrived. Uh, and this is actually what, what happens here, because um, Hugh uh, found it impossible to continue the siege with the arrival of Charles' army. Uh, obviously, uh, like when why you keep the, your forces all around the settlement, you cannot adequately uh, cope with uh, a concentrated mass of troops that can take out in detail all these ones. Even if you have, of course, always some mobile force that um, is not committed in the blockade thing operations, but uh, especially cavalry and infantry have to always to operate um, in in synergy. So. Uh, awaiting just for Charles the Simple to arrive, uh, you know, uh, line up for battle, uh, attacking the same fortifications around Epernay uh, would have been just madness from, from Hugh's side. So Hugh left the siege of Epernay in time. So mission accomplished as far as at least the, the defense of uh, that stronghold was concerned. Naturally, Charles' campaign had a broader scope, just as Hugh's one. Had. By the way, the source here are the annals of Flodward, right? uh, one of the most important sources uh, of the time. Um, so after having raised the siege of Epernay, Charles recrosses the Marne River and encamps at Chaumousy with the purpose of threatening one of the largest, especially the, the most representative city in terms of royal prestige in France, that is Rennes where uh, the, uh, all the, the, the Frankish rulers had been uh, crowned, right? So had a, a major, as you know, it's about Saint-Rémy, the, the first, you know, the, the, about, um, the, the first crowning of, of, of the Merovingians and the entire uh, mystique, right, of, of the monarchy that here Charles was essentially uh, incarnating from his uh, ideological side. Um, so Rem, besieged, Right, it, it's a big deal because the city is is the ancient Drucortorum. It's like all as we were saying before, these old Celtic opida that were eventually rebuilt um, with the Roman city that became bulwarks, fortresses in uh, say in the early Middle Ages, um, etc. So, while Charles was encamped with his army, the locally based militia forces of Rem made a, a, um, a sortie uh, and stole some horses belonging to the Lotharingian army, right? Because uh, these animals had been left uh, in a pasture not far away from the city. So what we read in the source, the Chivas, so literally the citizens, right? So not... Um, will specify now that uh, came out and managed to 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 loot like to, to seize part of this um of these mounds the fact that the term here employed is chivas is quite meaningful because we've seen it in other videos about communal europe etc they represent properly not the average commoner 
Jasper said could live in the city or outside of that, but probably the, the very the, the freemen, right? Which is in these countries that where the the freeman condition is rapidly deteriorating, um, the the cities do maintain instead, of course, uh, a higher, but also in the rest of Europe, but on average, this higher status. So um, here it's properly the the force of ram in uh, their their true blood that carry this operation out. Um, so the situation was uniquely worsening for Charles because horses were needed in many ways. Uh, first of all, for mounted combat that was rapidly accelerating in importance, it was, was quite advanced historically from, from centuries, way more than what we've seen, for example, in Eastern Francia, uh, exactly in these lands. And um, they, the horses are used also as spare mounts. There is all a, a balance, an equilibrium. Plus, the city was really big, right? So the entire logistics uh, was really demanding. And, and this blow, we do not have, of course, any mathematical certainty as most things military, but probably um, at least highlighted uh, further the difficulties in um, at least maintaining a prolonged siege of the city. Reason for which, however, Charles doesn't give up, and he orders, um, of course, the army of Hugh was was active still, right? So uh, he orders the walls of Ram to be stormed. So he tries the harsh way uh, for everyone involved, because, of course, he would hopefully uh, wait for wearing out was inside uh, before uh, before launching an attack you would just need to have time to see like to, to know a bit that the terrain in the first place the the fortifications naturally uh, there was like a standard uh, pack of knowledge for which uh, just you could eyeball how much you, you could um, do against such a fortification the most important aspect however is was uh, was always how many people were defending it and how many were attacking it and so there was a, a ratio of four five to one um, for the attackers to overwhelm the defenders now very often in these accounts we do not have uh, the actual uh, numbers and I as you know I rely as a historian dramatically on what seem to me when they really do in general uh, the the great accuracy um, of the narrative sources figures, right? That hardly are something particularly bizarre, unless you know they're talking about far, very far away places, almost mythical ones, right? But especially when they're describing the things they saw, as we will see now, um, in this case, um, as um, you know, other close and just renowned events. Of course, they detail uh, the. Uh, the, the give reliable sources. Of course, everything is subject to interpretation, and uh, uh, war is primarily a matter of moral forces, right? So uh, those surely cannot be quantified, if not just by comparison, right? A bit of military historical uh, experience. Um, in any case, um, uh, Charles decides to attack. The city and Flodoard wrote the annals of this event. Actually, inhabited Rain at that time, right? So he describes how during the the attack, many Lotharingians were killed or wounded before Charles ordered the attack to cease at nightfall, right? Which indicates the probably how balanced the odds, after all, were. Um, because in order to stop at nightfall, you would at least protract the uh, the attempt until then. Um, and uh, generally speaking, especially considering this was not a uh, say an open field engagement, sometimes were um, were uh, fought very late during the day. Also, I don't know towards the autumn, some kind of. Uh, campaign ending or something like that to to make the pursuit more complicated for the uh, it was better like 
even in the expectation of victory, like to to be cautious about that, right? And to allow at least some for, depending on the circumstances, of course, to even um, to even have the the possibility of fleeing uh, with with the favor of the darkness, even if you had won, right? So this would happen for the enemy, but the most important thing was still winning on the field. So it's a matter of precedence and hierarchy. But this was surely a bloody endeavor, um, as I described. Uh, it in other videos, siege warfare at this point, like basically throughout all the Middle Ages, was carried out by what we known as the say more 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 specific about the knights at some points, but the the militas we can say uh, during the 10th century, right? So the heavier troops, the men at arms, uh, who had all the the necessary uh, physical prowess to just stormed walls and they had the level of armor and experience um, capacity to just make this incredible effort with the support of lighter troops um, etc uh, and even at least this endeavor had uh, failed because of the harsh resistance uh, of the enemy and it was a protractically bloody fight so that makes sense um, also in terms of the casualties that Flodoard Possibly even a night witness of the same action records. So Ram could not be taken. Even if you didn't make it the first time, it was unlikely unless you know the enemy was the defenders were really exhausted to a degree. But um, here, even uh, the city is too much of a hard nut to crack. So Charles orders to. Um, to move uh, and to advance against the highly fortified Western Frankish castrum at Laon, right? Just to make you understand here, somewhere the map will pass by. But if you look at the area, like you have what is called here Rem, so Remi at the time uh, in Latin, of course Laon uh, Laudunum, right? So here we are between the Marne and the Oise triangle, right? Both rivers flow at relatively uh, small, this, say, some tens of kilometers from one another in into the sand, right? So this, this it's a sort of uh, schusser, like it, oh, it's an angle that kind of converges towards Paris. The, the mountain flows into the sand just um, a few kilometers upstream uh, of, of Paris. Um, and so operating in this area that has also an important center such as the Somme, right, um, means to, to be pretty close, right, to um, to the center of Western Frankish power. And so it's evidently a, a campaign overall aimed at inflicting a, a heavy wound to the, um, to the enemy. But there are also, in fact, lots of these fortified centers that will will act as a sort of shield, right? Historic, just think about even during World War the First, the Battle of the Marne, um, the two battles of the Marne, uh, and the fact that um, this, um, you know, aside from the river, but also the properly the the, the settlements, the, uh, the 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 heart, right, of this Western Frankish heartland is um, becomes a bulwark, right, for defending the main center of Paris, uh, etc. Laon is here indicated by the source as a castrum, literally, so something smaller than a city, uh, like it would have been a civitas, right, but here uh, we should look archaeologically at what we know about the centers. In any case, of course, it was a smaller one than than Ray. Um It's 50 kilometers away, so this distances could be covered just in, in one or two days, right? Um, and it required Charles' army to cross both the Vel and the Enne rivers, essentially bypassing the enemy-held fortifications at Roussy, which protected the best crossing of the Enne in the area, as well as the stronghold of Cormeny which uh, controlled the way to Laon about uh, 12 kilometers further north. So the fact that the Western Franks controlled this 
strongholds put Charles in a bit of a difficult situation. He had definitely the initiative and the larger force, but the enemy could harass him uh, along the way. So we were not informed in detail about this uh, these operations, but of course they were happening uh, all along. Right. Just think about the, the supplies. Uh, the here, as we were saying before, the, the territory is very thickly. Um, not just fortified, but also provided with stations. Not naturally, before the campaign, say, with the strategic movements, it would be things like scorched earth, also properly in, in the way of taking stuff away and, and or destroying a certain, um, a certain resources would have ended in the enemy hands and so on. But just for moving this force, right, you, you have all a, a train, a let's say a background from the same Lotharingia that allows you to, to operate. Now exactly because of these strains, after the attack of Ren and before the arrival to Laon, some Lotharingians in Charles' army came back home. Right. This is an interesting detail because um, it, it shows, of course, how limited for some of these men the political and military commitment was meant to be. They had probably suffered uh, casualties uh, during the storming, the unsuccessful storming of Rams' defenses. There was like um, like a deep difficulty uh, at the time to convince your own vassals to serve for more than a certain amount of time. Here Charles, of course, was aware of that. Uh, it was normal for armies um, to uh, experience these uh, defections. Um, naturally, the way that the troops would part could um, could vary in terms of chagrin towards uh, the leader and some other, thing, some other aspects instead were probably predictable or even properly established um, before. Uh, in any case, um, the Lotharingian army was still consistent enough in its core to prepare uh, to besiege the castrum of Laon. When Charles was refused the entry, because he asked uh, that uh, the minimum he would do um, to, to, to Laon, um, and uh, properly he, his, his command was uh, to render the fortress, and they said nuts, basically. The Lotharingians encamped on the banks of the Ser River and planned for an attack on the walls. This is really the standard modus operandi. These uh, expeditions were carried out on the expectation, of course, of this, this, some of these uh, fortresses to be perhaps less um, defended than uh, then uh, would it be enough to, to repel uh, your own um, but you had to check that right things would be uh, changing uh, in, in theory and so you you didn't know until you went there with your force how much the enemy would give way right this was probably the only way to to do right in part this was lesson learned also for, for our campaigns because obviously maybe at that point the enemy would have reinforced those very centers you had tried to to, to attack before but it was not necessary maybe they thought that even if rams had resisted they still needed to put more troops there than in these other places so all this was mostly to test the general spirit of the enemy in the first place Right, so to see even just from a political point of view what, what is happening behind uh, the enemy line, what what, what uh, the the Western Frankians believe on this uh, of this expeditions in the first place. Um, however, um, in spite of the rejection, uh, Charles uh, concluded that the castrum of Laon was too well defended to storm it uh, successfully, right? This surely was a decision taken in, in, within the command, right? The king would have his own 
uh, noblemen, like retinue, uh, veterans, like old people that were experienced politically, military, and that took decisions, like in a in to a degree of joint way, uh, and uh, Charles himself. Uh, uh, desisted. Um, this may indicate that his army lacked the necessary four or five uh, attackers per defender ratio. Um, but we just don't know enough, right? This may have been a, a moral problem because um, of the discontent in the army, as we've seen the, the defections, or maybe because Laund was just maybe overly defended uh, in that circumstance, um, and even randomly, maybe. Um, so it was just assessed that, no, you, you didn't have the force, the, the morale, the, the, the necessary spirit to, to take this place. Plus, uh, the Count Robert of Paris had arrived on, on the scene and was encamped in the environ of Laon. So... This was evidently the, say, the most disturbing factors, especially in terms of remaining there um, on a protracted amount of time. Um, the enemy uh, forces were consistently near to to disrupt, um, to threaten at least the Lotharingian uh, logistics. Right, Flodoard says that the Robertian force was being strengthened by new units. In the meanwhile. Um, and that um, he was willing to actually engage Charles uh, in open field had he remained at law. So this shows, as it's also pointed out by Flodoard later, that um, Charles refused properly the, uh, an open field engagement, pitch battle uh, with the with the Robertian army because. Um, it uh, it probably was just an unnecessary risk to run uh, at that point. Surely Robert was successful in preventing, as we've seen at the beginning, uh, with Epernay from from the other side, to um, uh, to rise the the what had practically not even began the, the as the Lotharingian siege uh, of Long. Right for the same reason, you would have exposed yourself uh, unnecessarily. You couldn't quite face because here, the the norm, by the way, is that whenever a battle was fought, uh, triggered, uh, typically as we've seen, by uh, the attempt to de to to conquer or or um, break the siege from a a settlement. Um, but the the the, uh, the the sortie of the of the settlement's defenders against the at that point the attackers would have had to face the say the main enemy army in open field and because of this unavoidably attacking the enemy from from the side which as we've seen very often in warfare is the deal you have a main front uh, where there are straight lines where the, the major forces are involved and then you can cause a dramatic psychological effect by attacking the enemy from from the flanks so obliging him to disrupt temporarily and hurriedly a great part of the internal lines let's say uh, say having to effectively fight on two fronts there even if the enemy attack from the side is is contained still can't cause devastating effects and that's how they, they mostly operated we were talking about very um also you have to imagine them as um again even in this fortification like in this relatively uh, say substantially civilized region uh, a very still a great of great importance also of the individuals uh, the 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 militas were Surely present in quantity, but still the, the, their exploit, the fact that still mounted combat was prevalent, but not necessarily ubiquitous um, across the, the entire battlefields. It would be, of course, like it, you know, battlefields are not basketball fields. You would find farms, uh, you know, other structures, ditches, whatever. You know, it all placed this kind of broader, uh, say.
not a messy or illogical game at all, right? But with a much greater, uh, say, a much more obstacle uh, terrain and where to to fight, which um, complicates things, to, to say the least. In spite of this overall failure, Charles decided not to dismiss his troops and calling an end to the campaigning season. Instead, when learning that the castrum of Chevremont was in enemy hands, he led his forces, the ones that uh, were still with him at Laon, um, so with all the, say, the older expedition, right, on a march of more than 200 kilometers to the northeast, to the eastern bank of the Meuse, right. Uh, this is a completely different theater, uh, and but it's still exemplifying the patchy, say, nature of this political um, and territorial realities, that is to say, rebels, people who are siding with your enemies, whoever, like it, uh, and threatening, in fact, your own, same possessions back home must, uh, exi do exist, and as a consequence also must be brought down. Because one thing is entering Western Francia, as we have seen, and trying to, uh, trying to seize some of the most important centers. Another is having troubled home, which is also just on a political level, more undermining. Even though, of course, even say a failure abroad is not just like uh, forgotten per se. Actually, um, the two events here are uh, evidently connected. Now, Chevremont is located at something like 10 kilometers southeast of Liège. Like, as a general, uh, just make you understand where we're talking of. So the Lotharingian army, now fighting in the same, within the same Lotharingia, because that's what this territory pertained to, began a siege of, of the center. However, at this point, Hugh the Great arrives with an army. So yeah, this shows you how far and wide these this forces could, could, could go, and how close these political... Um, uh, center's heartland really was to relieve the same Chevremont. And at this time, Charles understood once again the threat posed by the maintenance of a siege while being, uh, say, challenged by an enemy force. Um, so he broke camp, uh, retreated from Chevremont, and at that point uh, sent at least his levies home. Um, Charles had uh, even, it's at this point then he decides not to face the Robertians in open field, right? Because Flodoard says that this would have been impractical according to him, according to Charles. Um, it was a way that shows like also how advanced in the season that these operations were going. Like you could uh, eventually uh, come home and, you know, starting the next season, I mean, the, the season, like, of, of the good one of the year. Um, so, disappointingly enough, like, this is where it all gets down to. Yet, there are actually, as you understand, interesting aspects to to point out, right? So first of all, you, you realize this inter, say, uh, is interspace, where these armies cross, right, into each other's territory. There's nothing... You see, Lotharingia was a completely invented country. It was nothing, uh, let's say, national about it. Maybe there, there were some parts of it, but on a smaller scale, where, of course, uh, having a... like an identity on their own, we can see also very much later in time some correspondences, to, but not to the Lotharingia as a whole, right? From from the from the Swiss Alps to, to, to the North Sea. Um... In any case, the, the fact this territory is also um, uh, smaller. This, this was still part of, of the older Frankish interland altogether. Uh, and uh, if you want, the Thuringia is a sort of hybrid between West and Eastern Frank. But you know that it would endly fall to the 
ladder later on we will see campaigns connected to this too and this permeability is fascinating because you realize these were sort still of civil wars right you do not see uh, like different countries fighting against one another like with you know with previously established borders from centuries different languages different ethnical backgrounds basically similar clothes and the same uh, say what would you call French or German identities were, were yet to be formed were actually uh, taking uh, taking shape uh, in that sense right in, in a more marked way exactly at this point or from the ninth century way but you can't look at this space and simply saying like if, if you had interviewed a guy living I don't know in this in places like Liège or or Laon they, they would have of course, considered themselves different, but there was still a broader Frankish legacy here that was somehow felt. Lots of the people participating to these campaigns uh, were born when the Carolingian Empire was still one, for whatever that meant also regarding to these, of course, pre-existing um, differences. But it's the political side of the story, as you understand in, in the, the background, like the, the, the context here, that, that matters. There is essentially a um, a dynastic, a, a more strongly political, right, uh, fight of of rights um, and of let's say uh, recognition, also on a traditional base from the side of the various nobilities here than just some other uh, factor that was definitely there but was not otherwise uh, decisive. Uh, we see. Um, siege warfare dominating uh, and the capacity of the Lotharingians to operate against, especially against large fortifications. I mean, Rem was really large, right? And we've seen comparatively we've seen say uh, kilometers, say to the unit, like single kilometers of uh, uh, fortified perimeter for, for example, the, the Western Slavic fortresses, the largest ones, Prague, Vizar, etc. Um, here, easily for some of these Western Frankish centers, we can't talk of tens of kilometers of, of perimeter. Uh, so this this gives you an idea, I mean, just demographically speaking, of, of the forces involved, as we were saying before, the greater surplus, uh, etc., but also the, the greater difficulty. You understand here that Charles' failure could not be simply attributed to uh, weakness. Actually, his army was functionally operating. Um, just storming these fortifications came at a cost. The enemy could also concentrate a substantial amount of force in open field to challenge their maneuvers, which is something that we have not seen concretely, for example, on the, on the Slavic frontier uh, of Eastern Francia, where mostly the Slavs entrenched themselves into their hilltops and just very often say, okay, well, I, I agree. And then no, there is not even the need of storming those fortresses, even though the numbers were were uniquely there. So it, it's a very different political and strategic uh, situation that also comparatively, I think this is very important in military history all the time, to compare right if you study uh, any era or any country's military history and you just stick to that you will never understand what warfare is about because you cannot appreciate the scale by which things changed how they are chronically uh, etc so in these years in in this western central european theaters that are very very similar like warfare is practically the same uh, the world is you know in this civilized places is practically the same, right? There is not a radical difference in, in anything, um, if not in quantities uh, involved, right? But also technically speaking, we're talking about more or less the same things and the, the asymmetry is very low. You realize, however, how, in fact, different the, the picture looks, right? And this is what the military historian really does in terms of kind of elaborating on these single differences and tracing their a direction. That's the most important thing. Um, and so uh, Rem and Laon were, were actually big fortresses. For example, the castrum at Chevremont that Charles decides also not to attack 
because how there was a larger army come to, to challenge him in, in, in that sense um, was also uh, smaller and so this gives you the, the dimension of also the, the strategic projectional capacity of these armies and the fact that in spite of this fortified centers of course on the basis of, of political allegiance was possible to pass through of course even a, a very heavily fortified area consider that just the century before, this space was the one across which Charlemagne and, 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 and other Frankish rulers went back and forth continuously, thousands of kilometers across Europe um, in a single year without with a massive imposant logistical system that even at this point still works. This is very important to recognize, but it also works in the measure in which the resources are not used for this uh, mega operations uh, at, the, at the frontiers with entire peoples and new conquests, etc. But now to fight against one another, right? Um, there's an important quantitative dimension here that the shift, uh, the, the political will here. It's, there's not a crisis because you know this system had never known practically a, a public authority, if not by default a, a private one, right? So. It's a bit like the Roman Empire when it overstretched and uh, there was not much to conquer. Basically, they began to start against one another, and so even the second invasions, the barbarian invasions, whatever, were not much of a cause, but rather a consequence uh, of that. Not even achieving uh, particularly much in that regard. We've seen it in in the sieges of Paris, given that we are in the same places in the same year. The, the, uh, that I think last week in the video about medieval Paris. Um, during Norse invasions, well, that uh, makes you think immediately. Um, also, consider that the walls of Rem were stormed, right? So there was also a protracted action that resulted in a lot of blood, a loss which um, uh, tells you how courageous the defenses were on one side, but also the the will, right, of these of these troops, because just that Frankish stubbornness, right, uh, was still pretty alive, um, and the, the 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 an assault of that kind that shows the determination, at least at the beginning of the campaign. Because if, if you take Ram, by the way, it's just from a political point of view, it's a big deal, where right? you have a, an important chunk of Western. Francia under your control, and especially so close to Paris. It's, uh, again, a, a spiritual center of the, properly, of the Frankish monarchy. It embodies that, that sense of sacrality, properly, of, 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 of royalty, and all its mystique. It's just, from there, you have this massively fortified basis that also, if the Western Franks want to take back, they have to storm in the same way. So, Charles was definitely thinking big. Um, regarding the defense of Chevremont, we uh, see that in spite the center was smaller, the garrison troops still stood their walls, let's put it in this way, um, because they evidently knew that somebody was coming in their help, their their aid, um, but it still shows you, for a relatively small settlement, what kind of military organization existed in those times. So also the fact, here we've seen the, the levies, the militias, even the, the chivas of Ram, right? So we're talking about a fairly militarized population overall, right? Of course, the, the levies were mostly um, peasants the armed just with, I don't know, a shield, a spear, in a helmet, um, but uh, they still were part of the of of a of a of a polity uh, whose military machine relied on them, especially for their uh, for the siege operations, for the blockades. These were peasants, so they wouldn't make such great fighters. But as peasants, as farmers, they they know how I don't know to erect a a, a, a palisade, how to to dig 
uh, a ditch, all this stuff. So there is also a logistical side of the story that here we don't see because most of the accounts focus naturally on the on the militas and what are becoming during the 10th century probably the military class that would be also the basically the, the prototype of the later nobility um, emerging turn from it. Um, and uh, the Carolingian world had been about developing that elite, but we do know that, of course, um, infantry forces were still very important, and they would remain for for a consistent amount of centuries. Like at this point, the um, uh, let's say, of course, cavalry had, had the upper hand, but it was by no means decisive uh, all the time on the battlefield, right? Um, so even just the, the, this heavily fortified terrain, the, the sense that, again, you have to stop, as we've seen at every settlement, and having to carry out these complex maneuvers that can easily expose your, your flank to the enemy, just entail a, a pretty articulate organization that is not just about the elite, which is even just entering the fray in, in the moment of greatest need, as we've seen with the assaults. Meaningful enough, but also, of course, pretty, pretty traumatic uh, pitch battle confrontation. And these were people who were habituated in the process, also, you know, simply cutting people to pieces, raping, you know, it was the simple thing, right? You read it uh, in many ways, like what kind of measures were asked not to be done, especially <laughs> approaching the land time, as if, you know, burning churches or sacking monasteries were. But the same Christian forces was was something say more acceptable in the other times, if not you know chopping babies to pieces. And and you know that I I stand from the side of civilization. These were the most civilized people in Europe, as much as you know in uh, also most of the world. So uh, it's not an accusation in in a in a specific sense. It's just knowing that this was completely normal. Uh, or even if it was seen as a horrifying thing, it happened all the time. And other peoples were actually worse in, in the sense that they were dysfunctional at least in carrying this out. Right? They, everybody did the same exact thing regarding to these horrors, except civilization does the step for adding lots of other stuff. It also allowed this man to crush the others. Right? So this is what civilization really means. Um, and it turns out it improves um, over time as well. So including avoiding the necessity of carrying out such atrocities. But that's a, a long, a long journey. Um, so there is a, a more ideological spectrum here that doesn't simply emanate, but the fact that here the empire, or what remained, because the empire remained technically as in the traditional sense, the imperium was there, God would um, make the Holy Ghost descend on the most perfect medium, uh, the commander of these armies was successful in that regard. But at this point, there was factually no um, no center in the empire. Like the uh, the time the Etonians were to rise were, well, admittedly not so distant, but another generation to, to fully kick in as uh, empire renovators, uh, as the title goes. Um, so we find, we look at some of the most, say, disorderly pictures here and and as you understand just from a military point of view everything makes a lot of sense as much as it does politically obviously um so we appreciate uh, the the functionality of the carolingian military system still being alive at the time of charles the simple and basically never involving at that point because actually it would be a further privatization to some degree of the system uh with feudalism say, uh, developing, but it, it's also the same process from which, uh, say, states would evolve paradoxically. So sometimes, in Western French, is definitely the best example of that from the feudalism, in all its, namely, decentralization and privatization, it actually is a much more stronger gluing factor that allows eventually, in fact, the so-called feudal, feudal monarchies to rise and concentrating power over said weaker systems. So there is not really much else, like we could add uh, a lot. Um, there is, uh, Flodward talks about really lots of siege warfare, right? So 
at some point we could literally read this entire pages and saying you know look look at what it actually was right like Lotharingia and the Tansy and right? what they did how they 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 worked what how normal it was just to live like that again the the, the Franks did on, made only war objectively there was nothing aside from say that the, the the Carolingian legacy monastic development in say, some sort of cultural homogenization but their entire point was warfare every single year and so even though we are legitimately impressed by the unitary direction that energic rulers like the uh, say Charlemagne or also others that were lucky like him to 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 leave let's say um, to outlive their 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 brothers such as Louis the Pius etc um, these operations albeit smaller are not less what it was Frankish culture and what it would be the later one, the one we see in the Crusades or we see in Norman times or beyond, right? So uh, it's looking at the seminal part of European history, my opinion, the post Carolingian times are one of the single most overlooked times in the first place for understanding the, the fullest European identity, in my opinion, that uh, it's really a shame nobody really talks about them. So, so it is. Today we just look at this for the sake of some strategy video, just very modestly meant. Uh, we will hopefully talk again about, especially this Lotharingian theater, where also the Ottonians will start to operate, and so there are lots of very fascinating campaigns to, to observe. And so also the evolution, as just like the one we've seen on, on the Slavic frontier. However, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. Uh, as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.